Welcome to our webinar on the ROVs of deep ocean exploration. I'm Melissa Ryan. I'm Vice President here at the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. And we're a nonprofit based in Mystic, Connecticut. Our mission is to explore the ocean. And we do that primarily by designing, building, and operating remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, which are underwater robots. And these can dive as deep as 6,000 meters, not feet, but meters. So we have a really talented group of engineers, two of whom you'll hear from today, and they'll be talking specifically about two ROVs that are owned by NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, but they're designed, built, and operated by our group here at the Global Foundation. The robots are named Deep Discoverer, which you'll hear referred to as D2, kind of a mouthful, keep saying Deep Discoverer, and Sirius is partner. Um, what's special about these robots is that they work on the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. And when the robots are diving, the imagery that they're seeing is streamed live through the internet. So you can actually see what the ROVs are seeing, and you can hear the pilots um, flying the ROV. You can hear the scientists talking about whatever discoveries they're making. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. Everybody is on mute, and but you can still type questions for the presenters. You should have a question and answer box. If you scroll over the top right hand corner of your screen, you should see that pop up. And so you can enter your questions at any time and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So um, I'll hand it over now to Chris Ritter and Bobby Moore. Yeah, hi everyone. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. My name is Chris Ritter, and I'm part of the mechanical engineering team uh, for GFOE. And I have a dual engineering degree in ocean and aerospace engineering from Virginia Tech. My name is Bobby Moore. I'm part of the GFOE electrical team, and I graduated from Davidson College with a background in physics. And Bobby and I have 10 years, uh, or almost 10 years, uh, working on these vehicles together, and we've conducted hundreds of dives. So with this two-body ROV system that we'll be talking about today, uh, we conduct operations from the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, like Melissa said. So for any given expedition, uh, GFOE sails with a talented team of around 15 engineers uh, with the experience necessary to complete these deep water dives. Uh, our group is unique in that we focus on putting properly trained and educated engineers, and not just technicians, at each position. So each engineer uh, also participates in all the facets of this engineering system from start to finish. So we design, we build, uh, we maintain, and we operate these vehicles. And there you see a picture of D2 going in there. So uh, now let's take a look inside the ship. And we'll start uh, in the control room. Uh, so this is a wide angle view of our uh, ROV control room and we'll start by going through some of the positions here. Front and center is the pilot who controls Deep Discoverer or D2. And to his or her right uh, is the co-pilot who uh, controls Sirius. And on the far left there is our navigator who serves as the interface between the Okeanos and our two pilots in the two vehicles. And of course we have two video engineers in the control room at any given time as well. Uh, we have one on the far right there operating all of the cameras for both vehicles, uh, as well as all of the topside cameras on, on the ship. And we have a, someone in the clipping station taking out all the video clips to be used for future highlights and uh, future scientific reference. So that's the top side piece. So let's talk about why we use a two body ROV system. And we'll start with what it would look like if we had just a one body system. So a one body system represented here, you can see D2 at the bottom, Deep Discover, directly attached to the Okeanos. But as you can imagine in this configuration, the heave and the motions from the ship uh, would be translated down this tether to D2. So uh, how do we decouple that motion from D2? We add another body. So that makes it two bodies. And this uh, secondary dampening body here is Sirius, and we'll talk about Sirius next. And Sirius is directly attached to the Okeanos. They see, these two bodies see the movement uh, from the 
waves in the top side heave and sh ship motion. And D2 is uh, allowed to be loosely tethered to Sirius to take some of those high quality still images and get some of those fine samples that you see. So since we can't give you an in-person tour of our vehicles today, we figured we'd give you a, a virtual tour using our detailed cab model here. So this is Sirius, uh, our dampening body, or technically our clump weight. Um, and that's what this could be, This uh, just the dampening body, a simple uh, uh, weight on the end of, a, of this 6-8 line here. Um, but we took it a little bit further and we made it a, uh, an advanced ROV um, that can assist with operations. So I'm gonna pause it here and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at uh, the 6-8 line, which is attached to uh, the Okeanos, which Bobby will talk about a little bit later. But this is where that line comes into Sirius in the termination J box, which I'm highlighting here. And then the power goes through this transformer and is distributed uh, to all of our systems. So the high voltage comes into this transformer and then is distributed uh, throughout the vehicle. So coming down the starboard side here brings us to our the first major purpose of, of oops, sorry about that. The first major purpose of Sirius, let me get back to where I was there, which is the lights. So Sirius is named after the brightest star in the sky. Um, and these 18 high powered LED lights uh, shine the way for D2 below. So that's our ma first main purpose of Sirius. And it's what gives it its name. And as we mentioned, Sirius is not just a, a dumb clump weight, uh, it, it actually can move as well. So uh, we have two thrusters here, one forward and one aft, as well as its uh, motor controller bottles. And these two thrusters allow us to, along with some of the control software that Bobby will cover a little bit later, uh, give us our auto heading ability and allow us to line up uh, perfectly with D2 uh, to, so that we can see where D2 is going. Which brings us around to the last major purpose or role of Sirius, which is to be the eye in the sky. So these cameras highlighted here in yellow are some of the uh, various cameras that give us that uh, third person view of D2 for situational awareness. So we have a wide angle camera on the bottom of Sirius. We have a pan tilt and zoom camera. And then we have uh, some smaller cameras for situational awareness with the tether. So we can keep an eye on everything. And then we have our main Zeus uh, HD camera here, which is identical to the one on, on D2. So we'll talk about D2 next. There we go. So D2, uh, one thing that's not totally obvious about D2 is its size. Um, so if you're just watching the live feed, you might not know, um, or if you've just seen images, you might not know how big D2 really is. Uh, so D2 is about nine feet tall and uh, close to nine feet wide and it weighs around 9,000 pounds in air. So think roughly the size of a, of a minivan or, or something like that. Um, and D2 is, uh, like we talked about, D2 is attached uh, through a tether to Sirius. And just like on Sirius, uh, through this tether comes our power and into this big transformer here. And then our fibers and our data, which goes, uh, which go into our termination J box here. Highlighted in yellow. So rotating around to the port side of D2, uh, you might wonder how we get around and uh, how we stay at depth. So we have six vectored thrusters, which you can see here. We have two verticals to go up and down. We have two laterals to assist with turning and to go left and right. And then we have our two axials, which go forward and aft, and then also uh, assist with that turning. And uh, just like on Sirius, Bobby's going to talk about how we get that really fine control with some of our control software and joy, joy boxes or joysticks later. Rotating to the front of D2, uh, we'll check out its lights. So D2 has 
uh, as you can imagine at depth, we lose visible light very quickly as we're going down. So we switch on our LEDs uh, right at about 50 meters um, and we keep them on the whole time as we go down. So uh, we have 26 high powered LEDs, the same ones that are on Sirius at the, on the front of D2 here. And eight of those are on swing arms that we can deploy and control for very fine lighting uh, for all of our, our image, imaging and everything that we want to take a look at. So with that imaging brings us to our cameras here, highlighted in yellow at the front of D2. And just like on Sirius, we have a main HD, which uh, Bobby will talk about the, the specs of this later and show some of the images of, of the really high quality zooms that we can get. And we have a few other cameras, a pan and tilt camera uh, and some more HD cameras that, sh that really give us that uh, situational awareness and so we can uh, do high quality sampling and imaging uh, right in the front of D2 here. So you might have wondered how those swing arms uh, with the lights are deployed and that's through our hydraulic system here. So we have a motor uh, that's similar to these to the thruster motors uh, that pressurizes our system with a with a pump to three to about 3000 psi and our manipulators are controlled hydraulically and each of our other functions like all of these swing arms and the drawer that goes in and out uh, and the wings are controlled through these valve packs which are electronically controlled uh, valve packs from top side um, that give us that really really fine control of our all of our hydraulic functions that's a quick overview of d2 And let's talk about how deep D2 and Sirius go. So both D2 and Sirius are rated for six to 6,000 meters or roughly 20,000 feet. Uh, and that's about 3.7 miles. So uh, that's close to 9,000 pounds per square inch and 600 atmospheres. And when D2 and Sirius are descending, when we, if we go to 6,000 meters, we can only go down at 30 meters a minute. So, uh, if we go to 6,000 meters, that takes over three hours. So really deep. And let's take a look at what that immense pressure might do to a materials that are not designed to withstand it. So this time lapse shows a simple styrofoam cup uh, secured to D2 to show what the pressure does to this polystyrene material. So during descents to the ocean depth, uh, the accumulated, accumulated weight of water increases and pressure therefore builds. So uh, in fact, the pressure builds about 15 psi every atmosphere every 33 feet. And as pressure builds, it uniformly squeezes the air out of this porous polystyrene. So not a very good pressure vessel. Uh, and since the pressure is uniform, it shrinks down uh, and maintains that cup shape. But obviously we don't design our pressure vessels out of styrofoam. So let's talk about what we do design these out of. Uh, we've got a, a couple of options to keep seawater out of our systems. So the first one is uh, we design high, we design pr these pressure vessels. So this is a view of our uh, manipulator control bottle uh, made out of titanium uh, that we designed. And the idea here is to keep everything out of these pressure vessels. <clears throat> so the shapes that we use are typically cylindrical or spherical uh, so that we can spread out the stresses of this pressure radially along, along these shapes. We generally use cylinders uh, because they're easier to manufacture and therefore uh, a little bit more cost effective. But you can see here in this uh, bottle, uh, hemisphere was used uh, as an end cap on this control bottle. And so you might wonder what you're looking at here. These are uh, two images of, of some of the brains of our ROVs. And this one is D2 on the right here. This is a long titanium bottle uh, that Bobby uh, really helped to design and, and wire all that wiring in there. Um, Bobby and some of our engineers did. And so this long titanium bottle is the brains of D2. So you might, that's why it's so important to keep all of that water out of there. So our other option is a compensated system. So the basic idea of this system is to add a small amount of internal pressure to a volume filled with an incompressible fluid, so something that can't compress, 
so that the fluid on the inside wants to get to the outside of the volume instead of seawater getting in. So using the principle, so we use this principle that a compressive pressure applied to the outside of a volume must be countered by an equal, or in this case, greater force on the inside of this system. So here's a little animation just showing, we use a piston, which is exposed to this ambient pressure, add a spring, and that keeps the internal pressure of, of all of these oil-filled hoses and J-boxes up so that uh, seawater cannot get in and this, internal pressure uh, keeps it so that if things were to leak, they would go out and not in. So now we'll kick it over to Bobby, Bobby to talk a little bit about the 6-8. Thanks, Chris. So we use what is referred to as a 6-8 cable to connect the ROVs to the ship. It consists of three conductors and three fibers. So why fibers? Fiber is required for an ROV system because other methods, both wired and wireless, do not provide the distance, real-time, high-speed communications required for ROV operations. For example, a Wi-Fi at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz is quickly absorbed by the water, traveling on the order of centimeters. Lights work a little bit better, but they too are absorbed on the order of hundreds of meters. Lasers have the ability to penetrate the water and reach greater distances, but the technology is expensive and lasers can be highly dependent on water turbidity and aiming due to the narrow beams of lasers. Sound can reach the, can reach the ROVs from the surface, but is very slow and delayed. The speed of sound in water is about 1,500 meters. So at 6,000 meters, that takes four seconds for a pulse to reach the ROVs. Clearly that would not work for our, our real-time sampling operations or video. What about copper connections like you might find in your house? Well, we don't have to worry about this too much at home. Electrical signals that travel uh, through copper cables suffer from electromagnetic interference and signal de degradation uh, due to resistance. Uh, these characteristics essentially determine a maximum transmission distance or really how long your cable can be. HDMI is an example you might uh, be familiar with uh, at home. HDMI for your TV can only run about 50 feet before the signals get so bad that you don't have a nice picture. That leaves fiber optics as the choice for ROV communications. Fiber takes advantage of the speed and distance of lasers by providing a solid glass tube uh, for the light to travel down to the receiver. Fiber can go very long distances. It's immune to EMI. It's very, very fast, which gives us that live video and those live sample operations. Uh, and all of that for a fiber that is only a little bit thicker than a human hair. ROVs require a lot of power for all the lights and thrusters on board. By increasing our voltage to over 3,000 volts and using three-phase electricity, we are able to use the three small conductors in the 6-8 cable to power both vehicles. The catch, we don't actually use 3,000 volts of electricity on D2. As Chris mentioned, we require transformers on both vehicles to convert that voltage into a power that we can use for our various cameras, lights, and sensors. This is all very similar to how power plants get electricity to you at home. They bump up the voltage very high, pass it down the high transmission lines that you see, and then convert it down to the 120 volts AC that you see in your wall outlets. As Chris mentioned before, D2 has nine cameras and 26 LEDs for 144,000 lumens of light to help us understand where we are. These cameras provide incredible perspectives and viewpoint, viewpoints that really help the pilots know where they are. Here's a view of a shipwreck from one of our tow cams. These cameras are all displayed in the control room on the Okeanos. Pilots can refer to multiple camera views uh, at the same time to determine the ROV's position relative to other objects like rocks and shipwrecks. 
This is most useful during sampling uh, procedures and sampling operations as seen in this quad view. In this case, the pilot is able to see the sponge sample in the upper left while still maintaining three other distinct views of the manipulator holding the sample. Not only does this help us better estimate the size and location to take a sample, but it also helps us avoid damaging the vehicle with the very, very powerful hydraulic arm as we stow that sample in the sample box. And as Chris mentioned, we have Sirios to help us out, adding 135,000 lumens of light and multiple other camera views to give us that unique third person perspective. Lights and cameras though only go so far. So to help determine where we are at a greater distance, we rely on acoustic sonar systems. The simplest form is a single fixed beam, such as the altimeter you see here. The altimeter pulses sound and then waits for an echo. Using elapsed time and the speed of sound, it can determine distance away, in this case, altitude above the sea floor. The next step up is scanning sonar. It's similar, but the transducer head that produces the sound is not fixed. Instead, a motor rotates the transducer head 360 degrees and records the echoes in order to paint a 360 degree picture. Catch there is that a new picture, each new picture takes as long as the motor takes to make a single revolution. Multi-beam in the top left is a step up from scanning sonar in that it sends out multiple, multiple beams simultaneously, meaning feedback in all directions is live. Anywhere you look at the screen is a real-time image, not delayed as that motor scans. Combining these sonars with cameras, we're able to create a full understanding of the ROV environment. Seen here, we're looking at a shipwreck in the top two views with D2's cameras. In the lower left, we see that same shipwreck from Sirius's perspective, which helps us keep a good eye on tether and everything else. And then in the bottom right, we see the beautiful outline of the bow of the shipwreck on D2 sonar. Cameras and sonars provide a picture of the immediate local surroundings of the ROVs, but what about the bigger picture? Some approximations are helpful. Tether length and delta depth can tell us how far away D2 is from Sirius. Strong currents and ship movements can cause the ROVs to move away from directly under the ship. We can approximate this layback uh, by using known values of winch payout and depth. Keep in mind though, that these are only approximations. The tether is rarely tight, and the 6-8 cable reacts to different currents at di different depths, forming catenaries and curves. So, so we need to rely on other sensors to give us more accurate positioning data. The ROVs have a suite of sensors to provide depth, compass heading, and acceleration values for all six degrees of freedom. With a known initialization or start point, and some complex math, these devices can determine exactly where we are and how far the ROV has traveled. Has it gone forward, up, down, left, right? Has it turned? Is heading at all? Uh, these are all things these sensors can tell us. Unfortunately, these sensors are not error-free. Over time, they culminate errors uh, with distance. So we need another sensor to help reconcile uh, the differences. Enter USBL or ultra short baseline. Uh, helps to think of USBL as the childhood game you may have played at a pool, Marco Polo. USBL works the same way. A phase array transceiver mon mounted on the ship's hull transmits a pulse. The ROVs hear that pulse and respond with their own. The transceiver is then able to measure the elapsed time and, and calculate a range and bearing for each ROV. The screen, the screen you hear, see here is the um, USBL software showing us the range and bearing of the ROVs located over here, ship and center. The transponders also provide depth data. There is a catch with USBL. The speed of sound, is, the speed of sound in water is not constant. So to improve the accuracy, we can run USBL in responder mode which requires the sound only to travel half the distance. 
Instead of the initial acoustic pulse, we send a trigger uh, via the 6-8 umbilical to the ROV, which then responds with the acoustic pulse. Now the, the sound has only had to travel half the distance and our accuracy is greatly improved. The USBL system provides a, a position of the ROVs relative to the ship. Using the ship's GPS and navigation software, we are able to then geo-reference that position on the globe. The ship also has multi-beam sonars mounted on the hull, which provides ma provide maps of the ocean floor so that we can now understand the larger picture and the larger environment of our surroundings outside of what we are able to see only with the vehicle sonars and cameras. It's kind of incredible to me to put all this stuff together. Um, if you were driving along and you happen to uh, come across a shipwreck, for example, which we have in our 10 years of doing this, um, you would be able to place an artifact uh, on the ocean floor. First, you would see that artifact on your camera. From there, you can measure the distance away and the size of the object with your sonar. You could then use USBL to determine where that ROV is in relation to the ship. You could use the ship's multi-beam maps to give an idea of where the shipwreck is located. Is it in a canyon or a, a crater as seen in the image? Uh, and then finally, you can use ship's GPS to tell exactly where that artifact is located on planet Earth. So now that we know where we are, how do we stay there? And the key to staying uh, at depth is to first achieve neutral buoyancy. So that means when the pilot lifts uh, his or her hands, D2 shouldn't sink and it shouldn't start rising towards the surface. So how do we achieve that buoyancy? We do it through syntactic foam. And uh, through this foam, which is really dense, so you might think of foam as, as something soft, uh, this syntactic foam, which you can see being loaded on the D2, uh, on the image on the left there, uh, is really, really dense, so it's really hard. Um, and here's a cross section of this foam seen under a microscope. And it's comprised of hundreds of thousands of tiny glass spheres, which create that buoyancy, uh, which are suspended in, in a hard epoxy resin, which gives us that denseness or that hardness. So we talked earlier about how the foam is really buoyant. Um, and how do we achieve, so how do we achieve that neutral buoyancy if the foam pack is positively buoyant? Uh, meaning it will start to rise to the surface. So D2 is designed in this way to be positively buoyant. So in the event we lose all topside power and communications, or if we lose thruster control for some reason, D2 will slowly rise to the surface so it can be safely recovered. And we tend to keep D2 at about 100 pounds positively buoyant. So for reference, if D2 were floating at, at the surface and someone stepped on top of it, it would start to sink. And so how does D2 stay at this depth then if we have all of that buoyancy? We use our thrusters. So D2's thrusters are constantly pushing water up and the vehicle down using what we call Z bias, which probably we'll cover here in a minute, uh, to perfectly balance out that positive buoyancy from our syntactic foam. So with both of those uh, forces going, we achieve our neutral buoyancy and using the thrusters uh, to push water up, it has the added bonus of uh, avoiding stirring up all of the super fine sediment and easily agitated seafloor on the bottom. Each pilot has a graphical user interface or GUI and a joy box to control the vehicles. The joy box contain four joysticks, uh, thumb wheels, rotating knobs, illuminated push buttons, and a touch screen to control all aspects of the vehicle and sensors. As Chris mentioned, we use a feature called Z-Bias during every dive. Every dive. Z-Bias is controlled by one of the knobs and it essentially just puts a constant vertical command on thrusters. This allows the vehicle to remain neutrally buoyant, neither floating up nor sinking. Now, whenever the pilots are pushing joysticks, all that motion is relative to a perfectly buoyant vehicle. Joylock is another feature that we use often. Uh, Joylock, uh, it does what it sounds like. It, it locks the joystick from any other commands and holds the last known command. This is particularly useful when collecting a sample. You can take the vehicle, gently set, set it down on the, on the bottom, 
will push it up uh, gently against the rock, enable joy lock, and those thrusters will keep uh, uh, moving while you, your hands are now free uh, to manipulate. We can also use our navigation sensors on the vehicle and advanced math to build autopilots for the ROV that let us automatically control our heading, which way we are pointing, uh, or our altitude off bottom, or our depth. We can also tell the ROV to hold a, a specific position, or even better, to move to a specific position. We can allow us to conduct accurate XY transects, or you may have heard this referred to as mowing the lawn. We kind of just go back and forth in a grid pattern over an area. So we know where we are and we're able to stay there with our autopilots. Why does it matter? Like any camera, a stable platform is required to prevent blurry shots, particularly in our relatively low light conditions. Without a stable platform, we are unable to take advantage of the 18 times zoom uh, on our main HD camera. Zoom that lets us see coral, see that coral like this, or these corals like that. The stability allows us to see squid eggs, oil droplets, or fish eggs very clearly. Or in this case, a beautiful yellow sponge. A stable platform also allows us to make in situ observations. For example, the corals on the left on that rock wall. Corals are very delicate and some take hundreds of years to grow. Uh, we'd hate to uh, contact any of these and destroy any uh, corals. Uh, similarly, brine pools, as you see in the bottom right, are very delicate features uh, of the ocean floor. Brine pools are essentially saltwater lakes located at the ocean bottom. Due to the huge size and momentum of D2, it's very easy to kick up and disturb uh, the brine pools. Autopilots let us uh, avoid that. In addition, many creatures uh, res quickly uh, respond to motion and hide, such as that tube worm, or as seen here, coral polyps, clams, and anemones. We also need to know the precise location and be able to control the vehicles when exploring historical sites. Uh, shipwrecks are very delicate, and many are historically important memorials, such as the Titanic or the USS Indianapolis. Seen on the bottom right here, D2 is surveying a Japanese mini sub outside Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This sub was part of the Japanese force that attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and led to U.S. involvement uh, in World War II. In fact, this sub was sunk by the USS Ward and is, and is considered the first shot, shot by the US in the war, happening hours before the aerial assault later that day. Clearly, this is not a memorial that we wish to disturb. Stable platforms and precise locations are also needed for scientific surveys. On the left here, we're using um, a laser scanner to create a 3D model of a shipwreck. As seen in the middle picture there, uh, the device requires low to zero light, so the pilots must rely uh, on sonar and their autopilots, not cameras and lights, in order to drive and maintain position above this shipwreck. On the right is an example of that uh, mowing the lawn procedure I talked about. In this case, it's over a geological tar lily, which is essentially just a column of tar that has erupted from the seafloor and then split open to create this flat. Flower. By going back and forth with the downward pointing camera, we're able to create a photo mosaic or a bird's eye view of this very fascinating geological feature. And of course, there's plenty of other stuff down at the bottom of the ocean. So we need our navigation and our vehicle control to avoid entanglements and obstructions, both man-made and natural, like nets, traps, geothermal chimneys, or rock walls that uh, show up out of nowhere. Sometimes it's as bad as a cable spanning the canyon as seen in that sonar view in the center. And uh, I think with that, we'd like to turn it over to some questions uh, and maybe dive a little bit deeper into some of the engineering questions that uh, you have. Melissa? 
Yeah, we have some questions coming in. The first one is, how thick is the tether? Chris? The, well, the, the line going down to the vehicle is the 6.8 is uh, 0 0.68 inches. Uh, so that's why it's named that. Um, and the neutral tether, uh, I don't know the exact diameter, but it's not much different than that, is it, Bobby? No. Uh, I, sh I should have mentioned uh, the neutral tether has the same three fibers and three conductors that the 6.8 uh, contains, which provide the com communications and power down to D2. And you can see it kind of for size reference in, in one of the images in the bottom right there in uh, one of our engineer's hands there. Okay. Um, another question is, have we used LBL positioning? That's a very good question. Uh, we do not use LBL uh, systems uh, in our operations. Uh, for those of you who don't know, LBL, long baseline, is very similar to USBL, uh, except many transponders are dropped uh, or placed uh, in precise locations on the ocean floor, creating a more or less an acoustic net. Then by uh, using triangulation, like you might uh, have seen in the movies with a, a cell phone come bouncing off the, the respective towers, uh, you're able to very, very precisely uh, locate uh, the position of the ROV, sometimes down to centimeters. We would love to use it, but they take time to set up and they're also not very useful in moving operations. In our, deep, in our daily operations and, and dives, we often cover 500 meters of, of distance, horizontal distance, uh, and setting up an LBL system for that sort of environment is just not feasible. Uh, so we rely on USBL uh, for our location. Okay, how are individual units tested for ocean depth prior to field use? We, uh, we actually use pressure chambers uh, for most of our pressure vessels, so we'll take them to a, uh, a facility that can increase the pressure inside of a chamber uh, and simulate that 6,000 meters worth of pressure or 9,000 PSI. Um, and we'll do that for most of our pressure vessels that are, that are holding those electronic components. Um, and uh, things that we buy off the shelf, like uh, lights and those things come with, it, with the same certification. So they've been done, uh, not in-house, but at the manufacturer. I'll add one more thing to that. Um, as Chris mentioned, everything uh, must be certified or tested before it goes on the vehicle. Uh, we do this because uh, due to the immense pressure down there, a single failure can actually have catastrophic events, uh, uh, effects uh, causing failures in other pressure housings or other, other cameras, lights, et cetera. So one failure could lead to the destruction of the entire vehicle. How do you practice flying the ROV? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so one, one way we do it um, is, uh, like we mentioned, if we go down to 6,000 meters, uh, we have over three hours of what we call blue water. Uh, so when the vehicles are going up and down uh, or down from the ship, uh, we, we have some time in, in the water column away from um, obstructions or, or, uh, or the seafloor. And uh, during that time, we can get uh, some people in to, to get used to the controls of the joy boxes, not ma make any major moves or anything that requires the fine control of, of the manipulators or, or getting a, a high quality shot or a still shot or something, but just get the feeling uh, for the joy boxes. Uh, that's, that's one way we do it in the blue water. And uh, another way that, that we work, that we practice, um, as Melissa mentioned in the intro, uh, what makes our group unique is, is we get to do all aspects of, of operations. Uh, so we don't come on board just as a pilot or just as a navigator. And, and we get to cycle through and train in all the various positions. Uh, for each new member that comes into uh, dive operations, they generally begin you know, in the navigator position or on deck, and this helps understand you know, how do you work with the bridge? How do you uh, keep the vehicles where they need to be? You know, what are the different components that are located on uh, each ROV? From there, you move over to uh, the co-pilot position, uh, which is a, a much simpler vehicle compared to D2. There's no sampling. Uh, it's connected to the winch, the, the main 6.8, so it really can't drive anywhere. It can only maintain its heading. 
Uh, so you, you kind of ease into the point where you're in the main seat, you're in the pilot seat, where you're responsible for sampling and motion in all directions and, and everything else. So it's, it's a lot of training uh, and practice. That's a, that brings up a good point, Bobby, because I always found it interesting how you train with the manipulator arm when the, the vehicle is in the shop. Well, uh, as Chris mentioned, the, the, the biggest, well, the first step for in the water training uh, is there in the water column. There's nothing really to, to, to damage except the vehicle itself. And so often it's, you know, touch your toe or, or just reach out and play with the arm and, and get familiar with it. But before anyone ever gets there, we practice both in the shop and on deck. We have weights and other devices that we attempt, you know, to pick up, to maneuver. And we often start with, you know, deck cameras or other people giving you, you know, help. Hey, move the arm a little bit this way or move a little bit that, that way. So you get to know and understand the geometry of the arm. That's cool. Um, how is the dive recorded? Well, we, well, that actually might be a question for Caitlin, but we send um, all of our video topside to the Okeanos and uh, a number of our cameras are, are always recorded uh, for the dives. And then um, that's a big role for Caitlin in the clipping chair or whoever's in the clipping chair to, to take out some of those uh, clips from any of the cameras that we have uh, to be recorded uh, later to be distributed. Um, so we record on the, on the Okeanos. So Kaylin, I should say Kaylin Bailey is kind of behind the scenes here. You can't see her, but I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Kaylin, she's one of our videographers on board. Uh, sure. Um, uh, hi, um, uh, everybody. Um, so we, um, uh, we uh, record the uh, dives um, with a program called IP Director. Uh, we actually record the the, the entire dive. Um, so dives are, are usually around eight hours-ish and uh, we uh, uh, record both the main camera on D2 and the main camera on Sirius um, in a, a five, five minute chunks. And then the video clipper can access any of D2 or, or Sirius's cameras and then we can actually clip out angles from those like, cameras as well. That's great, thank you. Okay, we have a lot of questions here, this is great. Um, what kind of thrusters do we use and do we machine them ourselves? Bobby, you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, we have, uh, I believe they're five horsepower uh, motors that run, run our props. Uh, we do not machine those in-house. Um, the, the thrusters, the props, and the shrouds are all from the thir third-party companies. Uh, but we do, uh, we do run the motor controller designs uh, in-house. We use an off-the-shelf uh, motor controller system that we then wire up with all the proper electronics and fusing and power and everything else required. Uh, we put it into a housing that we design, uh, that the mechanical team designed, um, and then we're able to put it on the vehicle. Great. Um, what advice for students do you have if students would like to do what you guys do? Well, that's a good, that's another good question. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd say, uh, I, j I just always remember thinking back to, uh, in all of my science and math classes, um, some seeing some equations or, uh, or some concept that I thought I was never going to use and was a waste of my time. And I remember complaining about that to my parents. Um, and uh, I very much use all of those concepts now today. Um, so I'd say, you know, as much as uh, it might hurt sometimes, pay attention in those classes. And if you find something that you're interested in, you know, all of, all of our, the GFOE engineers come from different backgrounds and have different uh, you know, experience. So if you find something that you're interested in, I'd, I'd say pursue it in those fields um, and, and just start researching. You know, you can do a ton of research online for free um, and, and just start getting involved with it. Yeah, I, I would agree with Chris uh, on that. I can admit that 10 years ago, coming out of college, I 
who barely knew this industry existed. Uh, but the strong background in science, engineering, and math you know, prepared me for applying it to underwater vehicles. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, get experiences, you know, find someone, a family member, anyone who knows and can explain things and, and just learn. You know, there's engineering all around us uh, in everything we do, everything we look at, and, and you know, just try to learn and, and look at things and ask yourself, you know, why is it, why was it designed this way or, or how does this work? And you'll never know when you can apply that. Fiber optics is a big one. It's used um, in fiber to your home or your TV and your cell or uh, your phone and cable and internet and everything else. And it's equally applicable here to ROV systems. Good. Here's, here's kind of a fun question that we could probably talk about all day. But if you just give us a some short answers, that would be great. What changes would be made on the next ROV based on your observations with these models? Ooh. Yeah, that, that, that could um, get long. Uh, I, I think the first change that, um, the size of D2 right now is, is very large. So we, uh, you know, we, there are some limitations with with working with something that's nine feet tall and nine thousand pounds. Um, it, it also has its benefits, but uh, you know, with increased payload and and some of the other things that we can keep adding to D two, uh, but size is is probably uh, something I, I would. I, I know Bobby's in the same boat. Uh, there's the imaging technology out there is constantly changing and updating. You know, as you know, something like GoPro puts out a new model every year. Um, so, uh, you know, just adding adding some of that newer tech, new technology as it comes out, you know, which we do our best with, but uh, I'm, I'm always gonna ask for that because there's always something changing. Okay. Um... Next question, have you ever used stereo cameras before? And if so, what are some of the challenges you face with those? I don't think we've used those, have we, Bobby? I have not personally uh, used stereo cameras, but I've seen that done on other ROVs. Um, I know there are some issues sometimes with uh, matching focal distances um, and other characteristics, lighting, et cetera. But, uh, unfortunately, I haven't gotten, gotten to work with it firsthand. Yeah, me either. Hi. You mentioned that a commute to the site can be three hours. How long can you stay on site? Well, uh, technically, we could run 24-hour operations. So that's, that's one benefit of, of the two-body ROV system is uh, we don't have people on board the vehicles, and we don't have uh, batteries. So we have technically a, an infinite topside power source. Um, so obviously we're, we're limited with our with personnel and cycling uh, pilots in and out, but uh, our typical dives are, like Caitlin said, around eight hours, um, but we could stay at depth, uh, you know, for, for as long as we wanted to um, if we had the, the topside resources. Okay, how long is the maximum tether distance between Sirius and D2? That's about uh, 100 feet. I think it's 110 feet. Our meter, uh, our tether is 33 and a half meters long. Um, we sort of choose this value because if you start to get much longer than that, uh, you start to get out of visual distance. Even at, at, at 33 meters, uh, we still have dives in situations, particularly shallow dives, uh, where you won't be able to see D2 uh, from the Sirius uh, camera. There's just too much uh, stuff in the water, or sometimes it's organisms. Small shrimp and other krill will block the view. Uh, so we've, we found that 33, somewhere around there, uh, is a pretty good uh, balance uh, between having enough leash to work around and still maintaining visual. Um, there's nothing electrically that prevents the tether from being longer. Uh, because of the fiber and uh, the conductors, it operates the same way as the 6.8. So you know, I guess in theory, it could be six kilometers long. Yeah, and, but the more you put in between D2 and Sirius, the more you have to manage, like Bobby said. Um, and we've, we've worked with different tether lengths, and I, I think we've kind of got it dialed in just right now. 
Okay, another question is, do you avoid flying directly over shipwrecks? Yes, we do. Um, shipwrecks, you know, just by their very nature, have uh, lots of obstructions. Um, even if they're not related to the shipwreck themselves, uh, fishing nets and cables and other gear often get caught on shipwrecks. And you know, that, that's not budging, so the, you know, the, the fishermen will often cut the lines uh, and leave the nets or, or ropes behind. So there's always a lot of, of possible hazards when looking at a shipwreck. So the first thing uh, we ever do when we get to a shipwreck uh, is we do a perimeter survey. We slowly move around the outside of the entire shipwreck uh, to get a full understanding of what hazards and, and what, what's really there. Um, often these shipwrecks are too big to see uh, just you know, in one spot uh, with our lights. So we'll have to move around them to kind of survey what, what's out there. And then after that, uh, as we feel confident and, and with our autopilots engaged, we will move over the wreck, but we maintain a, a minimum altitude of about a meter. And this prevents any um, stirring or, or, or disturbing uh, of the shipwreck. And uh, I'll add to that, Bobby. We, we also keep Sirius uh, away from being directly over the shipwreck uh, because as we talked about, Sirius is, is hardwired or attached to, to the ship, which is seeing all of that motion, and all that heave. So uh, on, on some big heaves, if Sirius were directly over a wreck, um, we can see all of that water, you know, once Sirius is coming down uh, with the heave, we can see all of that water being pushed down and out of the way, and sometimes that uh, disturbs the bottom uh, and and therefore the wreck. So we, we, we try to avoid all of that. We, we keep Sirius uh, away from directly overhead the wreck uh, as well. And I just want to emphasize one more time that, you know, we go into every shipwreck uh, thinking that it, it could be a memorial or a war memorial of some sort. And so we really want to treat every shipwreck we find uh, with care um, as we approach it. Okay, we'll switch gears just a little bit. I'm combining a couple of folks' questions because they're pretty similar. And it's, it's one of my favorite questions because everybody has such a different answer. Um, can you tell us about your path to these positions? Sure. Go ahead, Bobby. Well, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, so like I mentioned, I barely even knew this uh, industry existed coming out of college. Uh, so it was actually reaching out to uh, alumni and networks. Uh, which I encourage um, you know, everyone to do. You know, it could be a neighbor's you know, cousin or whoever it may be. You never know what the possible connections are. And mine came through an alumni network at my school, at my college. Um, and from there, I went to Vermont. Um, I started off as an internship um, building uh, AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, after that internship, that turned into a full-time job. Uh, building um, and maintaining uh, ROVs. And that's actually how I first got involved with the NOAA program and, and Deep Discover and Sirius. Uh, and then kind of just kept doing it and, and getting experience. And after three years uh, at that company, I joined, um, I, I branched out uh, kind of as a contractor and, and been working with the foundation now uh, for the last several years. And it's been fanta fantastic. Yeah, and, and I started, uh, I, you know, I guess just like Bobby, I started with, with a general uh, interest in this kind of thing, but I didn't really know um, that this existed either. Uh, you know, I started with engineering um, at, at Virginia Tech, and, and I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I, I was there for ocean and aerospace, uh, but while I was in school there, um, I was interested in following along our, our boss's progress, uh, Dave Lavalvo, uh, his progress on a project with uh, remotely operated vehicles in Yellowstone. So uh, I eventually tracked him down through many emails and, and I'm sure annoyances. Uh, and uh, he, he uh, uh, reached out to me a few years later. Uh, and at that time I had taken a position uh, working uh, on ocean engineering for the Navy um, and the Navy and, and Dave and Noah formed a partnership where I could go out on some cruises and some expeditions um, and I, I kind of fell in love with, te with the technology, with the team, uh, with the engineering. Uh, now I work full-time uh, with the foundation. 
and uh, yeah, wound up here. I'm loving it. Okay, we'll do some more technical questions. Um, I'm assuming this means, do we have an emergency ballast releaser? We do. Yeah, uh, we we tend not to use it, um, and and we we've never had to use it for emergencies. Um, but we have a 50 pound, what we call a drop weight, uh, made out of plain steel. Uh, so something that would, you know, degrade in seawater over time. Um, that's uh, attached to a little a little tether at the front of D2, so we can pull it with our hydraulic arm. It releases a little gate, and that weight falls out and gives us 50 more pounds of buoyancy. Um, but we, you know, we try not to use that and uh, we really haven't had to use that for emergencies, but it's there. So it's good yeah. to know. I have a feeling that question was wondering if we were the, uh, similar to manned submersibles. Uh, no, we don't have explosive charges or anything that have to release a um, titanium sphere that houses personnel. We don't have to match those same uh, safety standards uh, or requirements. So the 50 pound weight uh, covers our bases. Okay, good question though. For the oil filled pressure enclosures for the electronics, you mentioned that these are pressurized positively such that they will always leak out oil in case of failure. Is this something that varies the pressure dynamically as you move through the water column or is it a static system? Uh, I'm not Oh, I understand. Um, no, so once we're once we're at a certain depth, those springs compress uh, from the ambient pressure. Uh, so they uh, they do keep compressing to a to a certain uh, level and then stay static uh, once they're once the that volume is full of that incompressible fluid and all the air is out. And it's usually around ten to fifteen psi, something like that. 